Hey everyone, um, welcome back. We're gonna give it another minute to let people trickle in as the last session ended and um, see if other people will join. But this is gonna be a greenhouse and season extension talk with Matthew Ozip of Iola Valley Farm. And um, we are having some people join, so we'll just give it a second. But um, if you have questions, please just put them in the chat. And then at the end, um, we will go over Oh, sorry, actually, we're going to do it that differently because Matt would like questions during. So if you have questions during the presentation, put it in the chat and then I will moderate that and ask those questions as Matt has a break in his um, speaking. So any questions as they come up, I'm sure there'll be a lot because this is a um, tricky topic in Gunnison with our 62 day growing season. So if you have questions, just put it in there. Um, Matt, if you want to get started, um, just talking about Iowa Valley Farm and how you got started, and then um, you can get started with your presentation, maybe about two minutes. All right. Can everyone hear me? Um, I mumble and I speak pretty softly. So if I start doing that, feel free to say something um, or else this will just be a mumble fest. Uh, my name is Matt. I own Iowa Valley Farm. This is our fifth season. Um, I've been growing food as long as I can remember with my parents and always had a backyard garden. Um, we have 14 greenhouses at the farm. Um, this is the farm. We have 14 hoop houses. We're in the process of building another one. It'll be a lot bigger than those. Those were kind of my prototypes. They're made of a lot of plastic and wood, which I'm trying to get away from, trying to go into steel and not PVC. We also have a passive solar greenhouse um, that's about 350 square feet. And that helps us germinate all of our seeds. Um, we grow everything from tomatoes to peppers, eggplants, tomatillos, flowers, um, and then outdoor, we do a ton of kale, a lot of brassicas, a lot of salad mix, basically anything that you can grow in Gunnison, we grow outside and anything you can't grow in Gunnison, we grow inside a greenhouse. And yeah, so let's just get started. Um, the biggest thing is a microclimate. Um, a microclimate is a slight or substantial difference in the conditions compared to those surrounding it. Um, there's all sorts of examples of this. You have frost cloth that creates a microclimate under the frost cloth. Um, greenhouses are a microclimate. South side of your house where the sun gets the most exposure, that's a microclimate. Um, other examples would be under trees. Um, you'll keep a lot of heat um, at night and you also keep that shade which keeps it cooler in the day. So it's not only it keeps it warmer, but it can also keep it cooler. Um, for example, we grow, if anyone can see my mouse, we grew potatoes between the greenhouse and these trees and they never froze once last year. And we also grew potatoes over here by these greenhouses and they froze three different times. So within a hundred yards difference, you can have a five to six degree temperature difference. Um, your highest point will always be your warmest and your lowest point will always be your coldest. So if you don't know where your coldest point is, just look for water. Water finds the easiest way downhill. So that's going to be your coldest point. Um, getting right into it, row covers. We don't use a lot of row covers, partially because we never really knew how. We kind of got into it last year. Um, Sue Wyman is probably the best at row covers. Um, so if you have any questions, maybe reach out to her. Uh, you can either put the row covers, the frost cloth, right on top of the soil, or you can use these things called wickets, and it's just a steel, uh, narrow gauge steel, and it keeps it off the ground. It keeps your plants healthy. Um, it's probably your cheapest microclimate, other than the south side of your house. If you have a house already, you can take advantage of that. Um, frost cloth is pretty inexpensive. It can go from 0.5 ounces, that's how they measure the thickness of the frost cloth, and it can go all the way to two or 2.5 ounces. Um, I We use the thickest, the 2.5, 
um, at Iola Valley, and you get about a 10 degree temperature difference depending on humidity and a lot of different factors. Um, if it's windy, wind can get right under that frost cloth and destroy that microclimate. Um, but typically, they're typically that doesn't happen. Um, other advantages, they can keep pests off. We knew a farmer down in Durango area and they had a grasshopper infestation. So they use frost cloths to completely cover all their plants up to keep the grasshoppers out. I'm not sure if it worked, um, but I think it definitely helped. And also with arugula, flea beetles up here are pretty problematic. So you can um, use the frost cloths to keep the flea beetles out. Another advantage is it keeps, it increases your soil temperature early, which helps for germination rates and quickness of germination. Up here, we never really follow what it says on the packet as far as how many days to germination. We always add a few because it's so cold, but with frost cloth, you can increase that and get a lot closer to what the seed package says. Um, some cons, wind can destroy the fabric and we usually use them in the spring and fall, which are typically our windiest times. So these people used either mud or rocks. I don't know who it is, someone from Google. Um, they use that to keep them down. A lot of people use sandbags. We've used fence posts to T posts, um, anything to keep that down, the more the better. Also labor is a con. You can, it's hard to water unless you have drip tape irrigation running underneath that frost cloth. Um, if you don't, you have to take the frost cloth off you have to water, put the frost cloth back on. So, but all in all, they're, they're very, very helpful. And you don't have to use wickets in a row cover. If you just have one garden, you can put a stake right in the middle of the garden, throw a frost cloth over it, and that'll really benefit your early spring garden. On that, we have a couple of questions. Sweet. Uh, where do you purchase your frost cloth? Where do I what? Purchase your frost cloth. Oh, um, Greenhouse Megastore has a lot of good options. Um, AgriFabric, A-R-G-I Fabric, um, that's a pretty good one. Farmer's Friend LLC, um, but they come in, it's like 20 feet wide by 300 feet long. So these are really, really huge frost cloths. If you are a backyard gardener and you just want a little piece of frost cloth like this one covering this cold frame that's just like 10 by 12, you can buy those at Ace Hardware. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Um, and then Rachel would like to know how big can the plants grow before the frost cloth is detrimental to growth and how much space do they need underneath the cloth? Um, that's a good question. And it kind of relates to this cold frame topic. Um, these are the ones I've built and this is one off Google we only left four or five inches and that really did not do good for our kale. Our kale is 12 inches and um, our cold frames only five inches. So that one, this is probably about a foot and that'll get you well into summer to where you don't need them anymore. But during those crazy storms this summer, we had frost in June um, and snow in June and we covered it with frost cloths and it crushed some of our plants, but they rebound pretty quick after that. Um, so yeah, there's not really an answer. I would keep it about a foot or so above, but if you end up crushing your plants, it's okay. They're, they're pretty strong and they'll come back. Um, Rachel, to follow up with that, she said, but the more space, the less insul insulating, so you don't make it modular. Yeah. Um, the smaller the microclimate, the better, um, I guess, I don't know the answer to that question, perhaps use thermometers and temperature probes to maybe test that out. And if you're not getting the results you like, bring down your frost cloth or raise it up if it's being too detrimental. I hope that's helpful. Or ask Sue Wyman, that's a good resource as well. <laughs> Um, is that all for questions? Sweet. Uh, cold frames are another great option. They're a little more expensive than frost cloth, um, but you can tell how pretty this one is. Um, they're great for curb appeal to your yard, especially in Gunnison. We're pretty, we kind of like that stuff. Um, 
Cold frames are great. We have cold frames in our greenhouses and we're able to grow year round. Uh, this is arugula December 11th, uh, 2020, and it rebounded. That was right before harvest. We harvested all of that and it rebounded instantly. Um, February 1st, we planted lettuce, which is a pretty sensitive green, I would say, compared to arugula and kale. And they sprouted almost immediately. Um, so cold frames are pretty great. Um, I would say 10 to 15 degree temperature difference, depending on how you build them and how well air sealed they are. Also, if you have a rodent problem, which we've had in the past, um, if you air seal it really good, the rodents can't get in and you have a great place to germinate seeds and a great place to just keep growing year round. Um, frost cloth and cold frames are great for extending your season about one month on each side of the frost free time. So it, for us, about a three month frost free growing season turns into five, um, potentially six, if you're growing spinach and kale. Um, I think Susan Wyman was able to overwinter some of her spinach using frost cloths, but don't hold me to that, I'm not sure. I think that's what I remember her telling us. Uh, greenhouses, any questions on cold frames before I dig into greenhouses? Um, can you talk a little bit more about how, if you were just like a backyard gardener, how you would build one? Yeah, so I built mine out of wood. Cedar is the best. Cedar is really good if you're going to have a lot of moisture contact, which you are with soil. Um, I used, I think, uh, two by 12s for that. There's some natural um, oils that you can use to seal the outside of it. So they last a lot longer. Um, and then there's the hinge back here, so you're able to open and close them. You can overheat a cold frame if you don't open it in the day during full sun. So even if it's just cracked um, on a cold day, um, you know, if it's sunny and 20 below, it'll still overheat. So um, you just need two hinges. We just use a little stick to jam it, keep it up. Um, ours, instead of glass, we have just clear greenhouse tarp plastic that's really thin. Um, so on top of that, I put a frost cloth and I doubled that up. So we have three layers of protection, um, but you just screw it together. You don't want to put a floor to it and then put your soil on because then you're not going to have worms coming up. Um, if you do do that, you're going to have to go out and get some worms somewhere else and transplant them in. Um, so that's something big. Um, but other than that, I just use two by fours for my lids. So I only have, like I said, four or five inches of space to grow. So that was a mistake. I would build it like this to where that front part is only about a foot and that back part is about two feet. So you have a good amount of space to grow. Um, we have one more question. When you use cold frames inside your greenhouse in February, do you add lights so that the plants get enough UV? No, nope, we're in Gunnison, we're in Colorado. Um, which, so, I forget the actual numbers, but I'm, it's pretty close to five hours of light, five hours of sunlight in the bread basket back in Iowa and back there is equivalent to eight hours. No, five hours of sunlight here is equivalent to eight hours in the bread basket. So our intensity is through the roof and even during winter solstice, you're still getting plenty, plenty of light. We never had any aphids on our arugula, um, which those colder, shorter days with less light, you can get a lot more pests. But um, even in a greenhouse, we have double layer, two different layers and each layer cuts out 10%. So we have 90% and then it cuts out to about 80% of actual light coming through and we still have no issues. So um, it works great. Greenhouses. Greenhouses are my absolute favorite. I found my notebooks from college a few years ago and all I found was doodles of greenhouses in my notes instead of whatever I was studying. So I've been obsessed with greenhouses for about 10 years and I've built around 20 of them by now and each one's different and I love it. Um, we have a lot of hoop houses, which is hoop house high tunnel, kind of go hand in hand. It's kind of the same thing. A hoop house is kind of the cheaper version and there's different types. This is like the hoop house style where you have the Gothic style, which I'll get into next. Um, your hoop house is your least expensive greenhouse to build. It's gonna be three to $4 per square foot. And the most expensive part is the end wall. So it's this part with the door. 
and you have two different in walls. So the longer it is, the cheaper it's going to be as far as price per square foot, because that inside is just steel ribs and or plastic ribs and then plastic covering all that wood on the end for your doors, your zippers. If you're using zippers, that's the most expensive part. So um, it's also the most expensive to heat and cool. Um, which I'll get to later. There's a lot of secrets to mastering that. Um, people think I have greenhouses and I can just grow year round and that's not the case. You only get about two to three degree temperature difference from outside the greenhouse to inside the greenhouse. So if you're growing tomatoes, it'll hold off those random frosts we get in the middle of the summer. But other than that, you kind of need a heating source or a way to hold heat, which I'll get into soon. Um, Hoop houses can overheat very easily. If you don't have the greenhouse doors open, um, we've, we've hit 140 degrees with everything shut. So if you're looking for a sauna and a greenhouse, I would build a hoop house. Um, Gothic style is just a little bit different. Gothic means there's just this little peak. And this is what Sue Wyman uses. I think they're great. I've just never had the ambition to build one quite yet. I don't like these roll up sides. Um, there's a lot of heat loss and air loss that goes through that gap right there when you roll the side up or roll the side down during the, during the night. Um, but it's really effective at heating it. Nothing over, overheats. You don't get heat stress on your plants and you can also get a tractor in there. Um, these are more commercial grade, more for farmers, but if you're really ambitious trying to homestead or you just want a giant greenhouse, do it. Um, it's a little thicker gauge steel than I use. It's about a two inch gauge steel where we use about one and three eighth gauge steel. Um, but they're very effective. Don't let me say they're bad in any way. Um, I just like being able to have complete control in that hoop house. And that's done by controlling as much air loss or heat loss during the night. Um, other types of greenhouses, you have your gable style, which I'm not even sure if that's the correct term, but that's what I call it. Gable just means your classic house um, you know, when you drew a house in second grade and it had the, the little roof and then the square body. Anyways, that's anything from a small hobby sized greenhouse, which is this one. And they're a little more expensive. And then you can go all the way up into a conservatory style greenhouse. And those are incredible. They're steel. It's basically a steel building with glass. Um, this little greenhouse is going to be a lot more expensive than building your own hoop house. Um, this is probably a thousand dollar greenhouse and you could build one like that, a hoop house that size for probably two to $300. So just keep that in mind before you buy that from Jeff Bezos on Amazon. Um, the hoop You're house, done. Go ahead. The what? two to three temperature, two to three degree temperature difference. Is that just at night or is that during the day? That's just at night. Um, I guess I'm more focused on this. This presentation is more focused on how to keep it warm at night because during the day we have really warm temperatures, but it just dips just below that frost temperature for a good month on each side of spring and fall. So if you're able to build a greenhouse and hold that heat in during the night, that's what's really going to help you. Um, during the day, you can have anywhere from like I said, it'll be 20 degrees outside and you can heat that greenhouse well above 100. Um, if you have proper ventilation, you can almost equalize from outside to inside. Um, hoop houses don't really work on the front range or in the bread basket when it gets to 100 degrees because then you're looking at like 110 degrees in your greenhouse and you're going to start getting some heat stress. So we don't, we don't see a lot of greenhouses back there that are being used in the height of the season. Um, so... Cool. Geodomes. I don't know much about them. I know there's like this huge cult following of geodomes. Um, they're really cool. I think they're shaped really cool. They add a lot of value to your property, I bet. Um, but they're great for backyard gardeners. They're a lot more sturdy. I know a lot of people, I've lost a greenhouse to wind. I think Blaine may have lost a greenhouse to wind. I'm not sure. I know Thistle Whistle lost one to wind a few years ago. Um, these do not blow away. That triangle structure is the strongest in nature. Um, you get these vents. Um, they're a lot easier to cool. Um, you can get stale air in a hoop house because it has to enter one end wall 
mixes with the air and then it's not really, you're not getting fresh air throughout your whole greenhouse unless you do it right. These geodomes, they bring in cold air down here and then they fresh cold air and then they, it shoots out the top. Um, they're, so they're very efficient at cooling. And they also, according to Google, have 75% heat loss than soft shell greenhouses. And I'm sure that's because most of these gaps are air sealed and they're using that double wall polycarbonate sheet instead of the poly tarp, which we use. Um, but they also have a great foundation. It goes below the frost line typically, and that keeps your soil very warm and healthy and the ambient heat from your soil will also help with a few degree temperature difference. Um, I would say a geodome probably is about 10 degree temperature difference at night versus outside. Um, but really do your research before you build one of those because they're probably one of the more expensive greenhouses that you can build. Um, heating and cooling, these are the two biggest things with greenhouses. Um, ventilation is huge. 20% of your floor, so if you have a hundred square foot greenhouse, you need 20 square feet of ventilation to keep it cool. And that's without fans. You could cut a little hole, have a giant fan running, but if you want, you know, a net zero, not putting propane or electric or any of that kind of stuff into your greenhouse, you can just build flaps, build windows that open, and you need 20% of your overall footprint in ventilation on your walls. So I hope that makes sense. Um, that's the key to ventilation. I've never had issues with that since I've done that. I used to have my greenhouses, it was 85 degrees outside and they'd be hitting 115 and tomatoes did not like that. You get your heat stress, your leaves would cup up and that's no good. So proper ventilation in a greenhouse is huge. Um, it also helps reduce humidity, which nothing really likes huge temperature swings or humidity swings. So if you can ventilate your greenhouse during the day, then you're gonna be a lot better off. Um, you don't wanna ventilate your greenhouse at night. Um, it's okay to build up that humidity during the night. It's not the best, but unless you have a system like this, this is, um, it could be a heating or cooling or ventilation system. This is a geothermal diagram of how to do it. I know Sue's passive solar greenhouse, which I'll explain what passive solar greenhouses are on the next slide, but you pipe cold air down, goes throughout the greenhouse, all throughout the floor, at least five feet down, and then it'll come back up. So it heats the air up and it doesn't really heat it up. It's not gonna come out hundred degrees. It's gonna heat up to whatever the ambient temperature of the ground is. Um, a lot of people, you know, cannabis growers, they'll use propane or electric heaters. They're just shop heaters and they run constantly very expensive. They're, you know, anywhere for a thousand dollars for the heater. And then you have to get the tanks and the propane and propane's probably $2 a gallon. And you're going to be running four to five gallons, at least in a small greenhouse per night. Um, passive solar is probably the best greenhouse that you can build. And let's get into that. This is a picture of Sue's, Sue Wyman's greenhouse over by Precision Automotive uh, is right after it was done. You have that hard polycarbonate shell. Um, passive solar means it captures the sun energy and then it stores it inside. And it also prevents temperature swings. So a typical greenhouse, you know, it can get to 30, you don't want it to, but it can get to 30 degrees at night and then it can get to 100 degrees during the day. So with passive solar, you can equalize that. So instead of having these huge waves of temperature, you can stabilize it. And plants like that stability quite a bit. Um, it's the most expensive greenhouse to build. This is, this is probably the most expensive one you could build. I've built a very cheap prototype, um, way cheaper and um, not quite as fancy at all compared to that, which I'll show you soon. Um, but Sue's, you can grow 365 days a year with absolutely no heating source. Um, I know she has some electric because she has one of these systems um, where she runs a few fans to circulate the air and she runs off geothermal and passive solar, I believe. Um, so this is the inside of our passive solar greenhouse. Um, I don't know, I just brought put that there so people could see it and see what it looked like. Um, 
at yeah. 20. Yep. Uh, Michael wants to know the approximate cost range of passive solar. So I don't know if you want to talk about the prop shed versus like Sue's. Cool. Yeah. So mine's about 300 square foot. Um, it's 12 foot across and 27 feet long. And I think I put about less than $5,000 into it. And I actually built the smaller one. So this was the old one that I was standing in. And then I did an addition and made that second one. Um, so it was built in two stages, which I wouldn't do. Just build it big, just like Sue's. I think Sue's was very expensive, um, well past the $100,000 range. But for food security in the Valley, it is a very, very, very valuable asset to this community. Um, but I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if she would tell you how much it costs. So, um, but they're very expensive. Um, the idea of a passive solar greenhouse, you have glass from here to here, and that's the only glass you have. So a hoop house, the entire thing is absorbing sun, whereas just this part is letting the sun in. This is south. So as we know, the sun goes up high and then it goes low in the winter. So you need to do the math to where that winter sun is still hitting your bed or the summer sun is still hitting your bed. And as that summer sun goes away, it stops heating these barrels. So you don't need as much heat at night. And then in the winter, the sun drops and it's able to heat all of these barrels and also get all your beds. Um, this part's insulated, your frost below ground is uh, insulated. This part of the roof is insulated as well. Sometimes you'll have a north roof that's insulated and then this north wall is insulated as well. Our sun never comes past that point. So the sun is never gonna enter on that north side. So that's why we insulate the north side. Um, and the whole part of passive solar is the concept of thermal mass and using thermal mass. And this is a greenhouse near Colorado College in Colorado Springs. Um, and it's just another example. Um, but this is their thermal mass back here. And that is my thermal mass is these barrels. So thermal mass is the storage of any temperature, hot or cold, in order to prevent temperature fluctuations. So when I tell people I put barrels in my greenhouses and paint them black, they're like, wow, like, and they go and touch them and they're expecting to like burn their hand, but it's not, it's only 70 degrees. So at night you get this 70 degree radiant temperature radiating off of these barrels. And then during the day, you also get 70 degrees. So if it's 90 degrees out, you have this colder air radiating, keeping your plants cooler, preventing that huge temperature swing and keeping you in that nice zone to where it's not going crazy. Um, the idea of thermal mass is you have two different things. You have thermal con conductivity and you have heat capacity. So this is a list of all the different things that have been tested for thermal mass. And the best one that you can have is water. And so everyone thinks like, well, let's build into the ground and the, the temperature of the ground will radiate back, not as great as water. And I never believed that until I did this last spring and used the barrels. Um, so your thermal conductivity is a measure of materials ability to conduct heat. So water has a low thermal conductivity, but that's also, that's a good thing because it's able to absorb some heat, but it also means that it can't lose heat fast either. And then you have your heat capacity, which is the ability to store it. And so it has the highest. So if you have lower thermal conductivity, you have a higher heat capacity. So water, you just can't lose temperature very much. So if you were to put a temperature therm uh, thermometer in my barrels, it would probably heat up to about 70 degrees during the day, and it would drop to about 60 degrees during the night. And then it just heats back up. And you can go three or four days without sunlight during these winter storms and you still don't lose, you know, it's not gonna freeze. Um, any questions? That was kind of science, science-y. I think you answered all our, their questions as you went along. Sweet, all right. Um, friends tell secrets. Um, this was, so I, I, I built my thermal, my passive solar greenhouse, just like Sue's. And so then I thought, well, heck, let's, I'm sick of spending thousands of dollars on propane every year. Like, let's throw some barrels in a greenhouse and see what happens. So 
this is a 40 foot long greenhouse and I put 19 barrels in there. I had, and I let it heat up for two or three days, shutting all the doors, letting it heat up to 130 degrees and just cooking those barrels as much as I could to bring it up to that 70 degree mark. Outside, my first test night, I had 14 degrees outside and I had 42.6 degree inside. Now that sounds pretty good, but with my heaters, I would get 12 degree difference with just one heater. Sometimes during the end of the season, if I was just trying to not let my tomatoes die, I would put four heaters in a greenhouse running $7 of propane per heater per night. So these barrels are 10 bucks plus a can of spray paint and they're phenomenal. Um, so then this winter came and I was freaking out thinking like, crap, these barrels are gonna freeze. And then I'm gonna have all these like broken mangled barrels. They didn't freeze once. It got to 20 below. As soon as the sun comes out, it heats them back up. Um, they never once even had a very, very thin layer of ice. Um, they have lids on top and you can unscrew them and look in and see if it's frozen or not. Um, the outside is covered with snow. Snow's touching, almost touching the barrels in some spots and I still had no issues. Um, so if I were you and you're thinking about building a greenhouse, build a hoop house, throw some barrels in there. You need more than one. Some people will just throw one in there. It doesn't really work. You need a big thermal mass bank. It's called a, a thermal battery or something, something fancy. Is there um, like a percentage that you need? Um, like, you know how it's like 10% ventilation? Do you know if there's a percentage for the thermal mass? I don't. Um, I don't. I did the calculation, which I'll do it again. Um, so you get about, I got 1.4 degrees per barrel increase. So, but in a smaller structure, you know, if you have a 30 foot greenhouse and you fill that whole back wall, with barrels, it's gonna be a different calculation and I'm sure it would hold in that same um, 28 degree difference, um, which is pretty substantial. So then the biggest, so the next thing is like, how do I take advantage of this and how am I efficient with my greenhouses? Um, last year we planted brassicas, broccoli and cabbage in one of our greenhouses and we planted them in June and they never did anything. And I was so frustrated and I was like, these seeds suck and it just turns out you, you can't grow brassicas in a greenhouse in the middle of the summer. You just have to know when to plant and what to plant. Um, great, grow your brassicas in the winter. You can, we had kale growing all year round. We had arugula growing all year round. Swiss chard kept going all year round in these greenhouses. Um, don't put them, just because there's thermal mass in there in the summer, doesn't mean it's gonna keep it that cool temperature that those brassicas like. Um, Lettuce, so your salad greens, they're gonna bolt really quick in a greenhouse. So when you can grow them outside in the early fall or late fall and early spring, you can bring those kind of things indoors or do a second seeding and they'll thrive and do a lot better. Um, also one thing I've noticed in five years is keeping your soil healthy and that's difficult in greenhouses because it's, it's really hard to water a greenhouse in the middle of the winter. And if you keep your plastic up, you don't get any snow in there either. And then sometimes we keep our doors shut in the winter. So we just have this desert and the soil just gets drier and drier and drier and plants will just shrivel up, whether it's grass or what have you. So the biggest thing is keeping your soil healthy. You gotta put, you gotta water it, put some mulch in there. If you can run hoses um, in the middle of the day, we run black hoses and we just let them bake in the sun until 10 or 11 o'clock and then we hook them up turn them on instantly and we're able to water our greenhouses no matter what time of year it is um yeah um dana wants to know where you get your barrels yep so there's a place by the car wash slash laundry mat which is over by paisan's area it's a place called Western Slope Connection. His, the guy who owns it, his name is Chuck Haas, and he has a scrap yard back there. And there are five to six to 700 barrels. Um, these barrels are 
used for spray foam insulation. So the inside of them is pretty nasty, but luckily it's, it's hardened. The spray foam is hardened and it's not like a liquid form anymore. So um, the key is to fill, I fill mine probably 90%. So there's absolutely no risk of overflow. Um, you don't want any of that water coming back in. I've never had a barrel leak. Um, you want to keep them up off the soil a little bit because they'll start to rust and then you'll be able, you might lose some water in there. Um, you got to be really careful when draining them. Um, you don't want to just like tip them over on your soil because then you're going to get some potentially nasty chemicals in there. Um, but we've never had an issue with that. Um, they don't fall over. They're extremely, extremely heavy. They don't tip over. You got to make sure you have very level ground and uh, they're about $10. They're not about $10. They are $10. And um, yeah, I, I have had them for a year. I've never had to top them off. People think the water might evaporate out. They don't need to be topped off every season. Um, and then, yeah, you just paint them black. Make sure you use primer or else that paint won't stick. And then you have paint in your soil as well, which we don't want. Um, I think you might've already touched on this, but um, can you talk about which side of the greenhouses you put the barrels on or the hoop houses? Yep. So in the very, very beginning in the spring, we lined a bunch of our greenhouses on the north side and it worked great. And then we used, we used some of those greenhouses to grow tomatoes and the tomatoes shaded out the barrels so they couldn't absorb sun. So that 28 degree temperature difference dropped to about 12 to 14 temperature difference between outside and inside. So I'm in the process of, I've changed. So now I'm starting to put them on the south side and I'm not sure how that'll work, but they'll get constant sun. And the only problem is when they're on your south side in the middle of the winter, they're, the sun's gonna project that angle. So you're gonna have kind of that dead spot right at the base of that barrel that's not gonna get a ton of light. Luckily, Greenhouse plastic um, refracts, I forget the technical name, but it, it scatters the light. The light hits the greenhouse and then it just scatters everywhere. So although it looks shaded, it's actually getting energy to those plants, but um, not the best case scenario. So you sat, there is a bit of sacrifice. You lose a good chunk of your growing space, but with us, we, you can plant the tomato, you know, an inch from that barrel and it does fine. Um, but if you're growing greens, you lose a, a good chunk of your greenhouse to putting that, putting those barrels in. And they're two feet. It's a two foot diameter. So you lose a two foot strip all the way down. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So. Okay. Well, that's perfect. Um, we have about 10 minutes or a little bit less. So if any of you guys have questions, um, you can put it in the chat or if you feel comfortable, you can always just turn your video and sound on and ask about any questions about greenhouse, greenhouses or season extension at all. Um, Matt, I have a question you could touch on is what about the um, plastic? Like do you have to redo your plastic on your hoop houses? They say it lasts three to four years, and that's the company saying that. So whether or not they want you to buy another bunch of plastic from them, or if they don't actually work, they say it degrades. So when you first buy it, you lose about 10% of that light coming in. And as the plastic gets older, that percentage grows, you know, 10 to 15 to 20% loss. Um, up here in Gunston, we've never had an issue. I'm on the fourth year of my plastic. Some of it's on its fifth year. Two other greenhouses are on the fifth year of the greenhouse and I double layer my plastic. So I'm cutting out even more light and I've never had an issue. Um, and if you don't believe me, two years ago, our tomato plants hit eight foot tall and last year they probably hit 16 feet tall. Um, so there's plenty of energy to make a tomato grow 16 feet in five months. Okay, we have a couple of other questions. Um, where might we find plans to create these cool looking hoop houses? There's just DIY hoop house, very simple. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of resources online that'll show you the structure. I 
people always ask for like my drawings and stuff. I've never drawn out a greenhouse other than in my notebooks. Um, but it's, it's fairly simple. You just need to anchor it to the ground and then build your ribs, um, which spacing of the ribs is all online. Um, pretty easy to find. You can easily contact me and I'll be glad to help you design a greenhouse for free. Um, and yeah, um, there's a lot of in YouTube. YouTube's great. You can find a lot. Um, the newer ones, the ones that I'm building now, I've, I've used PVC, just plumbing pipe, as ribs for the greenhouse to hold that structure. And they're starting to snap after four years, right at the coupling, right where they come together, because they only come in 10 foot lengths. You need about 30 feet to get across. And uh, so now we're switching to steel. And um, they make you, you buy chain link fence um, piping, not piping, but you know, the rods and it's called top rail. So if you look at a chain link fence, it has like the, the, your posts and then the fences between there. And then on the top, it's called top rail and that runs the length. Um, that's inch and three eighths. So it's a little smaller gauge than the posts. And on Google, you can buy and Amazon, all those websites, you can buy top rail benders and you can buy 15 foot radius greenhouse, like a 15 foot greenhouse or a 20 foot greenhouse. And it's, it comes, this, it's just this little chunk of steel and you can bend your own um, hoops and it's 40 bucks and 45 bucks. They're really cheap to bend your own. So. Okay, we have quite a lot of questions to go through. Um, so how do you keep snow off your hoop houses? Um, do you use hoses and how do you safeguard them in the winter time? Okay. Um, if you guys have lived in Gunnison, you've known that in the past five years, we've had three years of drought and two years of just absolutely epic freaking winters. And that one winter when we had 10 feet of snow, um, it didn't, I used the plastic PVC as ribs was completely fine. They were basically buried um, all the way up to the top. It just slides right off. Um, if I'm growing in there, um, after a storm, I'll just walk by and just kind of punch, not hard, but just kind of give the, give the plastic a little punch. All the snow will drape off to the sides. You'll end up with a good chunk of um, snow pushing, trying to push its way in, but I've never had any issues, even in Gunnison's crazy historic winters. Um, and then hoses, what was the question about hoses? Just how you um, get the snow off. I mean, you have that snow scraper to get the snow off the prop shed. Yep, so the prop shed, it's a flatter roof because of where I designed it. Sue Wyman's greenhouse, it has that real steep pitch. It'll just slide. Um, but typically, before I even get to the farm in the morning, that snow has already fallen off the hoop house and it's good. And if not, you just kind of hit it and it slides. So it's pretty simple. They're pretty, pretty strong structures, actually. Okay, Michael says, I'm new to greenhouses of the different greenhouse styles and the features and heating and cooling you covered. Which ones will pro prove most and least challenging in terms of aphids and other unwanted insects and animals? Um, I think that's more of a soil health question. If you have healthy soil, you're gonna have healthy plants. Um, so first start with your soil, make sure you have healthy soil. Um, I've never had really any issues. Our prop shed, which is our, our passive solar greenhouse, we get aphids quite a bit. And I'm not sure why. Um, I'm not sure if Susan gets them in her greenhouse either. Um, but aphids are the only pests we've ever really had to deal with. We had some on our kale this year too, but if you're pretty proactive, you can use essential oils and some really simple, not pesticides, but biologic pesticides, which are you know, funguses that attack the stomach of the pest. Um, there's some really easy stuff to mitigate that. And if you catch it early, you're fine. Um, and like I said, our kale was, you know, three feet from our arugula and it didn't, the aphids didn't bounce over the arugula. So it's just, it's more of a question of plant health and soil health versus what's what kind of greenhouse best designs it. So, but I'm, I'm talking about hoop houses and that's what we have. So hoop houses are pretty foolproof in my opinion. Um, and not really rodent proof though. Not rodent proof. 
Um, shout out to our CSA members. We have a couple asking questions. Um, one says, does the greenhouse have to be oriented east to west or would a north to south orientation work? If you're using barrels, I would definitely suggest east to west. Um, yeah, if it's, you know, sometimes on the internet, they'll sell 10 by 12 greenhouses. So if you're looking at more of a square greenhouse, which I wouldn't suggest, um, that doesn't really matter. But if you're doing a longer one, um, like we, ours are 15 by 40 feet long. So they definitely help when they're oriented that way. Um, okay, and what do you do for irrigation in your greenhouses or hoop houses? Mm, I pay my employees to water them with a hose and it's very... We also have irrigation in some of our greenhouses. You could talk yeah, about we that. Have, we have, our water is extremely salty. Um, not salty, but we have hard water. And so drip lines clog up terribly. I've made my own version of a drip line. We have a giant horsepower, three horsepower ditch pump. And we're able to pressurize those enough to where we don't get clogs. Um, so drip irrigation works. If you're running in town on city water, drip irrigation is great. They make little timers as well. And that's just, watering is very labor intensive. So if you can automate it, do it. Um, okay, and what size hoop house would you suggest for a backyard gardener? Mm -hmm. um, for a backyard gardener, probably about a 15 foot wide, which is what ours are. And anywhere from 20 to 30 feet, it just depends if you have a family of four, go bigger. If you, it's just you two um, and a dog, then um, you can go a little bit smaller. Um, trying to think of how many pounds of tomatoes I've produced in one greenhouse. And I would say it's probably around three to 400 pounds of tomatoes per greenhouse, which is pretty incredible. And that's from May until October. So then you can bring in your brassicas, you can bring in your salad mix and you can just grow. Just, it's amazing how much food you can grow in just a 15 by 30 or 15 by 40 foot greenhouse. They're very, very productive. And then what about the passive solar for um, backyard gardeners? Is that the same? Passive solar, um, passive solar kind of need to be bigger because you lose a lot more space to um, those barrels, in my opinion. Ours, we can barely grow. We have two small beds. It's a 350 square foot greenhouse and I think we have 30, about, 60 square feet of actual garden beds. So ours is designed more for propagating um, and starting all of our seedlings. Um, it's a lot harder to grow in there. Um, yeah, um, but they're not, they're just, they're, they're less effective. They're not, not effective, um, but they're a little bit harder. It just depends how you design it. You lose a lot of space to walkways and benches, um, it really comes down to how you design it. If you're gonna design it specifically for food production, then it's pretty efficient. Like these guys, they have a much more efficient system compared to ours is just, we have one tiny bed right here and one tiny bed here. And then this, this is shelving for seedlings. We built a shelf here for seedlings. These are seedlings. It's just a seedling thing, so. Okay, I know we're a little over time, but I'm gonna try to get to the rest of these questions. Um, from a sustainability perspective, which greenhouses and greenhouse components come to mind that are more easily recyclable or um, can be repurposed over the life of a greenhouse? Um, passive solar is probably the best. Um, these polycarbonates don't go bad um, as fast. I think they have like about a 10 year life. So they're probably best that you use, you use a lot of wood. If you can find recycled wood, then great, go for it. Um, you can hit construction sites, which I've kind of done, and you can see all this plywood's pieced together. Um, hoop houses are so much plastic. I, when, I, when I bought a farm, I had no idea how much plastic I would start using, and I hate it. Um, so if you're really anti-plastic, I'm sorry. Um, passive solar can be built with old windows as well. Um, 
and are still very effective. So if you have access to those recycled materials, do it. Um, and is there a reason that you chose steel over the PVC then? Did you already talk about that? No, I didn't. Uh, well, one, our PVC is starting to break at the coupling. Um, the steel won't do that. Um, PVC is horrible for, it's just toxic. Um, you don't want to mess with that. So that's why most, none of our PVC actually touches the ground. Um, yeah, steel is just the way to go. Um, it's, and it's way stronger. It'll last. My greenhouses will probably last 10 years. That steel one will probably last 20. Okay, last question. Um, are there advantages or disadvantages of growing on raised beds or growing hydroponically in greenhouses? Um, up here, hydroponic isn't great because it freezes easily. So if you have, it's not going to freeze, go for it. Um, in my opinion, hydroponics aren't necessary. We've created this whole thing called hydroponics to mimic soil, but we have soil, like let's just use our soil. It's how I feel it's easier, less maintenance, less inputs, less mining of those chemicals or organic materials into our hydro. Um, raised beds do great, it depends. We do raised beds because we have heavily clay-based soil and it helps drainage. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good to have those permanent raised beds as well. Um, so yeah, no really disadvantages of a raised bed, potentially disadvantages of hydroponic, but if you're into it, go for it. Um, I think they're more better, they're better with water, more efficient, so. Okay, um, I think that's it. Um, just for kind of wrapping up the conference, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, Matt, thanks for speaking and thanks to all of our speakers um, that took their time out for with no compensation to um, teach us all of their valuable wisdom. And you can learn more about the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild and all of the farms that participated. We're going to send out a PDF version of the slides that we're scrolling, all the ways that you can get involved in local food, Mountain Roots, Iola, Calder Farms, Sue Wyman's Farm, Gunnison Gardens, um, the Organics Guild, all those things. Um, and then if you wanted to catch like the seed saving or our backyard gardening or any of the other sessions, we are recording them all and they'll be on the Gunnison Valley Producers Guild YouTube channel. And we'll send you that link in about a week from today, they'll all be up there. Um, and then also we are having a local food cookbook and we will send you the PDF of that. We're still putting all the recipes together. And if you have any that you want to contribute with local food, um, you can definitely send recipes in to um, me or Sue Wyman at gunnisongardens.com that we have at least 20 recipes that we'll be sending out to all of you um, so you can grow um, and use and cook your local food. And then, um, if you want some tangible ways to get involved, like I said, we'll be sending a list, but the first things that come to mind are Mountain Roots Community Gardens, um, Isle Valley Farm has volunteer days, and we will be hosting those at the farm this summer. Um, Sue Wyman has a Tuesday night internship, um, and that's really helpful. I'm actually probably gonna do it, <laughs> and I'm already a farmer, um, because Sue Wyman is one of our best um, farmers in the Valley, so you can learn from her every Tuesday night starting this summer. Um, and the Organics Guild, um, Max Sawyer is on here. Um, I know he is the leader of the Organics Guild. I'm sure he will be able to tell you ways to get involved as well, but they usually have volunteer opportunities. So we hope this conference was really helpful for all of you. And if you have any questions, you can contact any of us. We can get you in touch with the speakers. Um, and we just hope that we can move forward for food sovereignty and food security in the Valley um, or wherever you are. I know we have people joining even from Alaska. So thanks so much. And um, we look forward to connecting with you later and for next year with the eighth annual Farm to Table Conference. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your Saturday.